Uh, good evening, everyone. Hope you all are doing well. Uh, today we have Dr. Rana with us, who has uh, uh, presented already the part one of the SCE high yield uh, facts. Uh, he's an ST5 diabetes and endocrine training working in the United Kingdom. Uh, the first part was already very popular among the trainees, and today we are here to discuss the part two of the SCE high yield facts. So, with that brief introduction. Over to you, Dr. Rana, for the presentation of the topic today. Thank you so much, Dr. Dalvi, for the opportunity. So this is the part two of that video, and we're going to discuss the first three topics from this index in this video. And the last four topics we will do in the next video, hopefully. And this is the next slide. So this is HbA1c and BM targets, which are frequently tested during the exams. So we know that the target for starting CGM is 9% HbA1c, and for that insulin pump, CSII, if HbA1c is 8.5% or above, that's an indication of insulin pump where you can start insulin pump. For surgery, the HbA1c should be less than 8.5%, that is for an elective surgery. And then we come to the first and second intensification. And if the, someone has got HbA1c of 7.5%, we should start the oral treatment for diabetes. And if that HbA1c still remains 7.5% or above, that's the time for the second intensification to add another treatment to the diabetes management. And then for the di dialysis, we usually target HbA1c between 7.5 to 8.5%. So these are some important HbA1c targets which are tested in the exams. Second important part of this slide is the uh, BM levels for someone who's pregnant and has got diabetes. So the fasting levels should be less than 5.3 millimoles per liter. And one hour postprandial should be less than 7.8 and two hour postprandial should be less than 6.4. So these targets should be met for a good optimum diabetes control during pregnancy. Third important part of this slide is OGTT, uh, values. So this OGTT test is done to diagnose GDM. So if the fasting level is above 5.6 millimoles per liter, that is diagnosis of GDM. And if two hours uh, levels are 7.8 millimoles per liter, that is also diagnostic of GDM. So just make sure that you don't mix up these values. We can see 7.8 is uh, for one hour value when it comes for pregnancy with diabetes. But that same 7.8 is for 2R if it comes for OGTT for the diagnosis of GDM. And the last one is the BM target for labor. For someone who's in labor, the targets are usually between four and seven. And if the, if the levels are above seven, we usually go for some uh, insulin treatment then. Moving on. So this is another important slide where we will discuss about important endocrine treatments. So there are some important uh, diseases which we need to know how they are treated. So I've pretty much summarized it here now. So there are so many diseases which uh, in endocrine we can treat with steroids. I've subdivided them into adrenal diseases, pituitary diseases, thyroid diseases, and some other miscellaneous diseases. All of them can be treated by steroids. So steroids are quite a backbone of treatment for most of these diseases. So while going through these, we'll need to go through these and you'll need to know that they, they can be treated with steroids, but we'll also go through some other important facts about these diseases to make this slide a bit more useful. First, quickly going through that some adrenal diseases which need steroid as treatment, that they include GRA, AME, CAH, Edison's disease, glucocorticoid resistance, and ACTH resistance. So these are some diseases related with adrenal in which the treatment is steroid. Some important pituitary diseases where the treatment is steroid is again pituitary apoplexy and some paracellular inflammatory conditions. For thyroid, AIT type 2, thyroid storm, graves of thalmopathy, decoverance, thyroiditis, and rapidly enlarging goiter, these conditions are treated with steroids. And some of the miscellaneous conditions in endocrine where vitamin D intoxication, hypercalcemia of malignancy, and vipoma, they're also treated with steroids. So just going a bit more in detail about these things, we'll need to know that 
Uh, we already touched a few of these things already in our first video, but important facts about GRA, which we really need to know, are that the GRA is glucocorticoid remedial aldosteronism. We have already discussed it in the differential diagnosis of primary aldosteronism. And then by primary aldosteronism, we already know that we've gone through a slide uh, about renin aldosterone levels for all these. So we know that in primary aldosteronism, aldosterone levels are high and renin levels are low. So we'll need to know that for exam questions. They will give you renin and aldosterone various levels and you need to interpret which class this one fall in. So GR is autosomal dominant disease and uh, it it can produce hybrid steroids like 18 hydroxy or 18 oxycortisol levels. So that is helpful in the diagnosis of GRA. And then there is chimeric uh, gene mutation where uh, 18 beta hydroxylase and aldosterone synthase, uh, that, that's the chimeric gene which is involving these two enzymes. And by that uh, aldosterone synthase, which comes under the control of ACTH and is represented and is uh, represented in zona fasciculata and zona reticularis. And that's why uh, the treatment for this will be steroids to suppress ACTH. Otherwise, it will, it will cause uh, mineral corticoid excess. Important points about number two, AME, apparent mineral corticoid excess. So this is an autosomal recessive disease as opposed to GRA, which was autosomal de dominant disease. So that's again, we've gone through some inheritance patterns in the previous video. So we'll need to remember this for exam. And it, it involves 11 beta HSD2 enzyme. That's an important enzyme which is involving it. So it can be a congenital when it is autosomal recessive, or it can be acquired when it is because of liquorice ingestion from cough syrups and some other things. And that's where it produces tetrahydrocortisol levels more in quantity, which is more than 10 times in type 1 AME and which is normal in type 2 AME. And another important question about AME can be the renin aldosterone picture. So we know that both the renin and the aldosterone are low in AME, whereas in GRA, aldosterone levels were high. Third important thing is congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So we know that there are many types of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So more important ones to remember is 11-alpha uh, hydroxylase will have, 11-beta uh, hydroxylase will have hypertension and hyperandrogenism, whereas 17-alpha uh, hydroxylase will have hypertension only, no hyperandrogenism, and 21 will have only hyperandrogenism with no hypertension. Important thing to diagnose CAH is 17 hydroxyprogesterone levels, uh, which should be done at 9 a.m. They can be done pre-ACTH stimulation and they can be done as post-ACTH stimulation as well. And again, you'll need to know the renin and aldosterone levels for CAH as well. In non-classical, both renin and aldosterone are low, whereas in classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia, renin is high and aldosterone is low. Next important topic is Addison disease. Again, the treatment is steroids. And in this, uh, renin is low, aldosterone is low. Uh, sorry, renin is high and aldosterone levels are low in Addison's disease. More important causes of Addison disease are autoimmune disease is more common in the first world countries, developed countries, whereas in underdeveloped countries, tuberculosis is an important cause of Addison disease. It can be a part of APS syndrome as well and polyendocrinopathy syndrome. And then uh, there are so many other important diseases associated with Addison's disease as well, like adenoleukodystrophy, which is an important exam question where there is very long chain fatty acids involved. And then it can be uh, adrenal hypoplasia congenita where there's DAX1 mutation and AAAS syndrome where, this is, where there is ACTH resistance and uh, achalasia and alacrima. Next important topic is uh, glucocorticoid resistance. Again, the treatment is steroids, but we'll need to know that glucocorticoid resistance can be autosomal dominant or it can be autosomal recessive. Uh, increased level of ACTH because of the resistance. And then uh, because of that increased ACTH levels, they can affect both the mineralocorticoid and the uh, um, androgens, and then DHEA levels can go up as well. 
and then they can reduce their symptoms of it. In mineral corticoid excess, it can cause hypokalemic alkalosis with hypertension. And if it is because of DHEA, it can cause hyperandrogenism, uh, hirsutism in female or precocious puberty uh, in the males. Next important topic is that of ACTH resistance. And that's autosomal recessive. And already uh, we have spoken about is in Edison's disease that it can be a part of a triple AS syndrome with uh, echolasia, electroma, and ACTH resistance can have autonomic uh, symptoms as well. Uh, ACTH levels are increasing it. And uh, usually there is impaired response to short synectin test. Next important topic where steroids are used in pituitary is pituitary apoplexy. So the free view of this particular lecture has ended. Uh, for access to this full lecture session, please subscribe to my lecture series, which is total of 60 lectures till date. Uh, these uh, will be provided access to via paid subscription plan. And uh, all the paid subscribers will be given a lifetime access to all my existing 60 videos lectures, which are already on the YouTube channel, plus all the upcoming new videos. So whatever lectures or sessions I'll be doing in coming weeks, months, and years, all of them will be uh, given access to in the same subscription plan. So for the full subscription details, please email me on mazzyrules at gmail.com or WhatsApp me on 0097155743479 and have the same number on the Telegram app as well. Uh, just to give a brief overview of the full lecture series, so it includes uh, different topics across diabetes and endocrinology. For diabetes itself is there are around 19 lectures which I've done across different topics which are useful for the exams as well as for the clinical endocrinology practice. In terms of uh, high yield topics for specialty exam and European board exam, there are around nine sessions which have covered all the previous exam recalls as well as all the high yield topics and themes which are frequently encountered in the uh, specialty exams and the European board exams. In terms of thyroid, apart from the thyroid cancer guidelines, which were recently uh, published, plus there are other sessions on different topics uh, related to thyroid uh, across the spectrum of thyroid disease. In terms of adrenal as well, covering all the important topics or sessions which are frequently encountered in exams and in clinical practice. There are two very good sessions on lab endocrinology by Dr. Well Murugan. Very helpful for those preparing for uh, DM endo or DNB endocrinology as well. In terms of pituitary also, I have covered all the important sessions on all the important topics which are frequently encountered in clinical practice and the exams. There are a few sessions on the inherited endocrine syndromes as well. Very important sessions on reproductive endocrinology about uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, gynecomastia, hirsutism, PCOS, diagnosis, evaluation, management. There is a sessions on calcium and bone metabolism, on familial lipid disorders, and uh, sessions on pediatric endocrinology as well. So just to let you know that there are many more sessions coming up. And as I mentioned, that in the same subscription plan or same subscription fee, you will be provided access to all my existing 60 lectures plus all my forthcoming lectures. So thank you very much for subscribing. Thank you very much for supporting.